Donald Trump had a bad night during the midterm elections. In fact, if you look at the candidates he endorsed, promoted, those candidates did not fare so well. If you compare them to the traditional Republicans who Trump has turned on, those Republicans did really well. So for instance, why don't we take a quick look at the great state of Georgia, where yes, Brian Kemp did in fact win against Stacey Abrams. So that's sad news, but take a look at his lead, okay? So he's at 53.4% and Stacey Abrams is at 45.8%. This is relevant because he did really, really well, despite the fact that Trump attacked him pretty viciously because he wouldn't do what Trump wanted him to do in helping him overturn the election to Trump's favor. Now let's take a quick look at the Senate race between Walker and Warnock. And if you look at this, it's too close to call. This is going to a runoff election. So there is no winner because no one passed 50%. But nonetheless, Herschel Walker, who was promoted pretty vigorously by Donald Trump, is at 48.52%. Raphael Warnock is at 49.42%. Um, so Jank, do you want yeah. to jump in on this? Oh, God, damn right I do. All right, guys, so this is the, we start with this because this is the most important election, not just in terms of determining the Senate, uh, where the Walker, Walker Warnock very likely will, because it looks like Democrats are gonna lose Nevada. And then if they win in Arizona, which they're uh, expected to do given where it is, here we go again, Georgia runoff would decide who holds the Senate. But more important than that, look at the gigantic difference between a sane Republican and an insane Republican. And so I'm not a fan of Brian Kemp to say the least. I think I, um, almost all the Republicans have radical ideas, but he is, um, so we, a lot of people throw around, including us, the word fascist. So what do we mean by that? Would I call Brian Kemp a fascist? No. Uh, so I, he's maybe a, like a reactionary Republican and he does the voter purges, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, mm -hmm. But he doesn't deny that Joe Biden won the 2020 election. He doesn't make up evidence after an election. And so he's just, he's attached to reality as opposed to being detached from reality. Now Walker on the other hand is on team Trump, fully detached from reality. And in the same state on the same night, that made an eight and a half point difference. Wow, 200,000 people in Georgia showed up and voted for Kemp and said, I am not voting for Walker. Yeah, that is pretty okay. It's incredible. almost exactly 200,000 people. Yeah. So Trump indisputably cost them 200,000 votes in Georgia, mm -hmm. cost them a gigantic eight and a half points. That's what I am now calling the Trump quotient. Mm. So that makes picking Trump in a Republican primary political suicide. You're costing your own team eight and a half points before anything even starts. So Republicans have at it, Hoss. Right. If you want to do that, you're playing with fire. And so me, I don't want to play with fire when it comes to democracy. I just rather have Trump not run or lose in the Republican primary. But Republicans, it is a guaranteed that you're going to lose, even if it's okay. And Georgia, by the way, is a perfectly representative purple state for the whole country. It doesn't get any more clear than this. You're gonna cost yourselves eight and a half points indisputably. Have at it if you want it. I mean, Pennsylvania is another good example, right? And I think that what happened with Mehmet Oz in the Senate race against Fetterman in Pennsylvania is kind of indicative of what we're talking about here. So in the Republican primary, even though Trump was <laughs> just asked over and over again by other members of the Republican establishment to not endorse Oz, he did it anyway. And Oz really attached himself to Trump during the Republican primary in that race. But once it got to the general election, Oz had to kind of backpedal, backpedal really, like and, and try to find a ways to disconnect himself from Trump. And he clearly didn't do a good enough job because Fetterman won. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I'll just mention, we're gonna have a longer conversation about that particular race later in the show. Um, I noticed John also tweeted this and I was thinking it myself. Turns out uh, making fun of disabled people who uh, suffered from a stroke, not so popular. Not, not a great campaign strategy, especially in a country where lots of people uh, suffer from strokes and go through the recovery process. I mean, I, I can't believe he even thought that was a good idea. but. 
I'm no, glad he I did mean, it. But it, Republicans can't help themselves. They're always gonna go to the most vicious attack. But to the Republicans who said, oh, he can't even speak, look at him, of course, no way, right? Well, he just beat your guy. And why did he beat him? Let's be honest, it's because Trump picked a loser. Mm. Trump always picks losers, including himself. And so, uh, look, the reason I'm elated today is because the main message of last night's elections was sanity. The Democrats did not do that well against sane Republicans, but they did really well against insane Republicans. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, we might actually get back to a country that is not on the edge of fascism. And that would be that's, amazing. And that is where I find a little bit of optimism. Okay, yes. So that's where the optimism lies. Now let's move on to other surprising uh, takes from last night. So let's get to this congressional race in California's 47th district. This is a newly drawn district. And unfortunately, it is not working to Katie Porter's favor. Katie Porter is one of my favorite uh, members of Congress. Uh, she has the right economic policy ideas. Uh, the mainstream Democratic Party was a little critical of her because she broke with the party in advocating for uh, the SALT deductions, which I actually agree with her on that. Even though those deductions, uh, of course, benefit some wealthy people, there are all sorts of working people who are not wealthy in states like California. Um, who really relied on that deduction and uh, doing away with it was obviously a retaliatory uh, tactic by Donald Trump when he passed his tax cuts for the rich. Nonetheless, because this is a newly redrawn district, uh, it is a tight race. The results are not complete yet. They're still counting ballots because California, of course, allows mail in voting. But Katie Porter, as it stands right now with 47% of the vote in, is at 50.28%. And uh, her Republican challenger, Scott Baugh, is at 49.72%. It is close, razor thin, and we don't even have all the votes in yet. So I'm, I'm actually scared about yeah. this race. So it, there's uh, complicating factors in New York and California where the Republicans uh, probably did best, those two states. Now it's interesting because those are uh, among the two most democratic states. But that means the Democrats have more to lose, right? So when they're uh, when the Republicans pick up any kind of momentum, they're probably going to pick it up in places like California and New York. Uh, now the Sean Patrick Maloney race we're going to get to in New York. That's also potentially indicative. Every race has its own dynamics, including the redistricting that Anna mentioned in Porter's race. But there is one other dynamic, which is crime. And uh, around LA uh, and around New York uh, City is where you see the biggest impact. Uh, Hochul should have won in a landslide. She wins by about five or so in New York. She won comfortably, but it was supposed nah, to be- No, but a, not yeah. nearly comfortably enough in a New York governor's Agreed, race. Yeah. Got called all the way at one o'clock in the morning. That was way, way, way closer than expected. And then you see the Maloney race and you see Katie Porter out here. So, so some of the things that we were concerned about, economy and crime, were still issues. They were just covered up by Donald Trump's a circus tent, right? So he since he pitched a giant circus tent in the middle of the election and clowns were running around, we got distracted, especially by his clown candidates. But when there wasn't a clown candidate in, we have really tight races like this. Yeah, absolutely. So let's get to Sean Patrick Maloney, because I think this is an interesting race for the reasons that you mentioned, Jenk, but also it's an interesting race because of who he was as a politician. So Sean Patrick Maloney, uh, is a Democrat. He also happened to be the chair of the DCCC. He was voted out in a humiliating loss. Uh, the GOP state lawmaker by the name of Mike Lawler won that race. Um, so how did Lawler do it? Well, he did attack Maloney on crime and inflation. Lawler's key uh, platforms of combating crime and tackling inflation mirror those of the party, but resonated especially well uh, in the new 17th district, which includes parts of Westchester County along with more ex-urban counties like Putnam and Rockland. It encompasses several diverse communities, including a large and politically active Orthodox Jewish voting block. The area also has a large proportion of households with first responders, law enforcement or military members. And so I'm sure 
the anti-crime message resonated deeply with the individuals living in that district for obvious reasons. But Cenk, what do you think about this? I mean, obviously yeah. it's not good to have a Republican win, an additional Republican member of Congress. At the same time, Maloney as chair of the DCCC made some bad decisions. 100%, so the chair of the DCCC's job is to make sure that as many Democrats as possible win in the House. And so uh, instead of doing that, when there was redistricting in New York, he did not stay in his own district. He decided to go into Mondaire Jones's district for two different reasons. One is he thought that it would be safer, oops. Uh, number two, he thought if I push Mondaire out and he wouldn't dare run against me because I'm gonna have all the money in the world. He's probably gonna go into Jamal Bowman's district. That way we are guaranteed to eliminate a progressive. Remember, Democratic leadership, you'll never hear this on cable news. But with maneuvers like what Sean Patrick Maloney did, it's very clear and they make it clear every time. And they also make it clear in their spending. We show that to you in every race. They hate progressives, they despise progressives. So Maloney thought, oh, I'll be cute, you know what? I'll F around, okay? <laughs> and I'll push Mondaire out. And Mondaire Jones did wind up going to a different district, not Jamal's. And he should get credit for that, by the way, mm -hmm. that he didn't go into Bowman's district. And then, but he did wind up losing, so he loses. And then Maloney's like, all right, I got all the cops and the firefighters, and I got a safer district. I'm a conservative Democrat, so man, those cops and firefighters are gonna love me. Are they? Are, are they? they? By the way, Max Rose in Staten Island, another a very conservative Democrat running around telling everybody how great Republicans are, lost by like 30 or 40 points because, because it turns out his voters believed him. They're like, oh yeah, you're right, the Republicans are better. I'll vote for them instead of you, right? So Maloney, after effing around, he found out. So if you said to me, do you want him to win the race or not? Yes, I would have said, of course I want him to win the race because I don't want the clown show to take over the House. But if you said to me, hey, X number of Democrats are gonna lose, which Democrat would you like to be in that batch? I probably would add Sean Patrick Maloney near the top of that list, so bye Felicia. So the one other race I wanted to bring up is the Senate race in Nevada against Adam Laxalt and Catherine, who's the Republican in the race, and Catherine Cortez Masto. It looks as though the Republican is gonna win. We have 77% of the vote in, it has not been called yet, but he does have a lead, he's at 49.9% to Masto's 47.2%. Yeah. I think it's gonna be tough unless they get all the votes from you know, predominantly Democratic counties in Nevada going forward. It's always possible, but but it looks like the Republicans are gonna win that seat. Now, it, last night when she had the lead, uh, I had filled out my poll and that was one of the only ones that I had gotten wrong uh, because we thought Cortez Masto was gonna win. Mm. And I was like, I'm kind of surprised by that because she's one of those lettuce candidates, just like a head that just sits there and does nothing, right? And so that's a classic Democratic candidate. I exist, I'm a Democrat, Republicans are bad guys. She's I'm, very enthusiastic and happy though. Yeah, she does, like, she did nothing during the campaign. She's done nothing as a senator, nothing, nothing, nothing. In other words, a very classic Democrat, right? And I was like, and those guys almost always lose. So uh, running against a non insane Republican, I was like, that seat's not at all safe, right? And so it turns out, yep, and now that's uh, probably a loss. Of one seat, we pick up Fetterman's seat, a seat in Pennsylvania that Fetterman won. So we're back to even, and Warnock and, and uh, Herschel Walker will decide who has the majority in the Senate, very likely, if, especially if Mark Kelly uh, finishes off Blake Masters in Arizona. But uh, the point here is, guys, look, again, it was Trump's fault because if they had not run clown candidates, the Democrats would have lost a lot more seats. When you have a standard Democrat versus a standard Republican, the Republicans won, if we're being honest. That's why the election results are not as good as they appear. But the reason we're elated is because it makes it even starker that it's definitely Trump's fault. Mm -hmm. and, and so that might mean that fascism is closer to being expelled from American politics. I, I like to think of the midterms this time around as having the Sarah Palin effect. Because like Sarah Palin was so incompetent that when she was set to debate Joe Biden, everyone thought she was gonna bomb, that she was gonna do so poorly. Just like right before the midterms, everyone thought there was gonna be a red wave. And when it didn't end up being as bad as we expected, it's like, yeah, 
we're still losing the house likely, and but we, we didn't lose as much. <laughs> yeah. And we might <laughs> even still lose the Senate, but but we're yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> and by the way, losing the Senate would be disastrous, especially when you consider what the Senate mainly does, which is confirm federal judges. So having Republicans in charge in the Senate would be, again, a disaster. Thanks for watching The Young Turks, I really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun, but you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video, thank you.